everyone. Welcome to the Lit RPG Audiobook Podcast. I am your humble reviewer, Ray, and I will be reviewing some recent and classic Lit RPG audiobooks for you. Today, I'm going to begin with Awaken Online, Apathy, Side Quest, by Travis Bagwell, narrated by David Stifle, with a 10 hours and 6 minutes length. Eliza blinked rapidly as blinding light flooded her vision. As her eyes adjusted, she realized she was now standing in a fantastic garden. Sunlight streamed into the enclosure, gleaming off the emerald, dew-studded leaves of the hedges that ringed the courtyard. Rose bushes lined the space in neat rows, and the pink, red, and white blossoms stood out vividly. Eliza looked up, covering her eyes to blot out the sun. She could see puffy white clouds drifting languidly through a crystalline blue sky. Insects chirped happily inside the garden, and the warm sunlight lingered on her skin. Rubbing her arm, she realized that she could actually feel the sensation, her sense of touch almost indistinguishable from real life. This is a game, she whispered to herself. Okay, you've asked for honesty, I will give you honesty. Here it comes. I'm really getting bored with this series. Awaken Online is the title because I need like three cups of coffee and a handful of no-dos to get through the latest books. Honestly, this started out as a fantastic series, uh, but it's just gone downhill. The best part of this book for me was the possibility that there was no chance of Alexion showing up, and he still has a shout-out in the book. I just I can't take it. I just don't like Alexion at all. I'd rather have had a book with no mention of him at all. Um, Eliza is just a milk toast version of Jason. And I'm saying that kindly. She has a crappy parental relationship, just like him. She gets jerked around by an in-game god, just like him. The only difference is, is that Jason's god, the old man, is so much cooler and much more tolerable. I absolutely hate Every moment that the hippie appears, speaks, or does anything. He is one of the most annoying characters I have read in a book in a long, long time. I cannot stand Fluffy. The, the sheep joke, just it does not go with me. I don't know what it is. I think he was looking to have a cool little sidekick character for animals. Like, you know, Demon's got the hippocorn, and, you, you know, I, I just can't go into it. There, there are some characters that are just awesome. This one is not. I don't like Fluffy. Fluffy is dumb. Don't know why he would do this, okay? Um, and I think that every joke that he does or uses in their spirit for the hippie or Fluffy falls flatter than a sheaf of rice paper. I just don't see the appeal of the guy or the black sheep in his every single appearance sends shivers down my spine. I just don't want to hear him talk or appear anymore. It, it's just that bad. Uh, the quests that he sends Eliza on are neither funny nor exciting. Honestly, at no point did I have a sense of danger or concern for her even when she was killed. Yes, she does come up with some innovative ways to kill things, such as the troll. But it was kind of like as exciting as watching someone kill a wasp with a can of raid you know i mean that was really smart you killed the, the wasp with raid same thing same thing it's kind of like watching somebody shoot a, a horde of orcs from across the river yeah he's getting the job done but i could take a nap or have a sandwich while that's going on it's just not there for me legolas in the movie lord of the rings and so on and so forth he's down and dirty stabbing people with an eye in the eye with an arrow this was not anything near that, okay? It was just kind of like, yep, she outsmarted the troll. She killed somebody that was way more powerful than her. Good for her because she used her brains. But it was just not exciting. And I really, I want to stress that. I have no problem with ingenuity or innovation or intelligence being used by a character. But it needs to have some sort of accompanying danger or thrill to it. I didn't have that as I read this book. It really, really put me to sleep. I struggled to get through this. I, I always say I never quit on a book. I never, ever quit. But this was one of those books where the writing is not bad, 
Bagwell knows how to write a story, but the story just does not work because he just tries to force everything to happen. With Jason and the other books, it's very natural and it's very realistic in its feel. And Jason is in in ingenious in what he does, but he's also a fighter. You know, he outwits characters, he outfights characters, he does everything he should to keep things interesting and moving along. Eliza is kind of like watching a piece of white bread march off to find some butter just to give it some flavor. There's nothing to her. There's nothing to her. Even when she tries her best and tries and gets a little power, it, it just it reverses. I'll get into all that, okay? Um, now, her solution for the stag was a bit more improved upon and she actually showed some life when she confronted the other players but that went by the wayside as she got back home to her little camp of safety the m one moment of real growth was swished pretty quickly seriously she kills a ton of players but feels bad when she's given a quest to basically wipe out a band of people who are pirating things it made no sense to me uh you know to get a bell she's got to wipe out people and she's she's worrying about who she's going to kill she's seriously not, not to spoil but she massacres over and over again players and characters and npcs and animals in one area and just levels up relentlessly uh with no concern she just says i need to get these people out of this area to do this and it's she is so ruthless and methodical and efficient at it that you say my gosh she's really showing some some hardening of character but it, she doesn't. There's no strength gained or garnered from that whatsoever. I don't understand it other than the fact that because she'd already appeared in the last book and she was kind of a wishy-washy character then, he couldn't let her get real hard as nails. He had to say, yeah, well, she did do this, though. She did do that, and it doesn't work. It just doesn't fly. You either have growth or you don't. You don't. And here... It's like she's on a treadmill. She does something really impressive mentally, but she doesn't go anywhere. She's going nowhere fast. In fact, the treadmill maybe makes her go backwards like this rather than staying in place because I don't see her doing a whole heck of a lot at any point. Um, in fact, the third book in the series was kind of mind-numbing Okay, when it came to the hippies trials. This feels like a lot longer, more drawn-out version of those trials. I really don't know why Bagwell was going in this direction. His first two books, Jason not only outfought, but he outfought his, his, his enemies. Here, Eliza seems like she's afraid to get her hands dirty, even when she does. The only real moment I saw a touch of Jason come out was when she confronted her PKers, okay? And there, she duped and destroyed them. Then she went right back to being old Eliza again. That was the whole book. Cry about how hard her life was at home, argue with the hippie, go do an asinine hippie quest, and then complain about it afterwards. Wash, rinse, repeat. Three quests. Three trials. It's eerie how they parallel. I really don't know if it was intentional or not, but again, it was just like one thing after another. It was so familiar. And I, I, I said in the last book that Bagwell did, the worst part of the book was the hippie trials. And this is nothing but one gigantic hippie trial. From start to finish, Alfred should wake up. He should awaken online and just whack the hippie. If a god has to die, because I know the one god of light, the lady who's the man who shall not be named's patron, she wants to kill the old man, you know, the god of... Kill the hippie! Do it! That's the right thing to do. I'm not for murder at all. I don't advocate it. But in this case, it's a merciful thing for the readers. Kill the hippie. Just kill the hippie, because I can't do it. Cannot. Don't know how to do it. Just cannot stomach it. <sighs> Again, I'll reiterate, as I did before, this book felt more like a pilot episode for a spinoff within an established series. Like, Chandler from Friends goes to visit his awkward cousin Eliza, and we spend some time with Eliza. Chandler pops back up to say goodbye, and next fall we have Eliza's show, The Awkward Herbalist, or The Anguished Alchemist. I'm not sure about the title yet, but you get the idea. This is not a series that I will continue out of love. 
I'll be sure to keep getting it to keep up the reviews, but that is really the only reason. Uh, and I don't understand the need for this secondary character to split off. He had two other players or two other characters in the books with Jason that he could have taken in any direction he wanted to. The the need for this extra woman, this extra alchemist or whatever, I don't see it. I don't understand it. Other than he just wanted to get away from what he was doing already. He needed a break. And in that case, do what everybody else does. You know, Dakota Kraut loves Divine Dungeon, but he stopped and started the Ritualist. Bling, okay. Base Corvin. He loves Delvers, but he did the Luxstat strategy. He did more, and then he's going back. So take a break. Take a breath. Take a breather. Step away. Don't make up some wimpy character that I don't know. I don't know if there's anybody out there that loves this character. If you love Eliza, please mention in the things below there in your little comments why. Because I have no connection to this character whatsoever. None. I have been that kid alone. I have been that kid that was roughed up by his parents in some way. I've been through everything that Eliza probably has in this, this series. And it just does not ring true to me at all. It does not. It, it just seems like Bagwell has a parental issue. I said this in the last review I did of his books. And he carries it out in this character just as much as he does the other three characters in his other book. Okay. It, it just is a way of working out his emotions. I'm really not enjoying it for a fourth time. You know, last book, we had all three people come up and show how horrible their parents were, how, you know, how things were. And it's the same thing again with Eliza. I'm really getting tired of the bad parent. I'm a parent. I have, believe it or not, we're going to be adopting here real soon, which is going to make me have five kids, five children, five. Oh, my God, five kids. Yeah, I have, I'll have five kids here by this time, mid-February, I think. So, I'm a parent, and I care about my kids' education and quality of life. And there are things that I do have sticklers, you know, I'm a stickler for. Education is one of them. I can totally side with the parents saying, you need to study and keep up your grades. But I'm also the kind of dad that says, take a break and step back and relax. My youngest son started college when he was 12 years old. He's 15 now, and he is not blowing his mind. We go out, we laugh, we have fun, we study, we work on things together. It's amazing. He's not ready to go insane. It's possible to be done. There are people who can be competent, good parents. I would love to see that come out in one book from Bagwell because it's just getting old. It just really has rubbed me the wrong way, and I just do not enjoy it at all. And I, I know I'm rambling here, but that's because this is just one of those things. He he just cannot break out of that mold. As a writer, you've got to stretch and do something different. Okay, if you're going off into a side quest, then damn well do a side quest. Do something different. Do a change. I would I, I really if this was another series coming out, I would not get book two if I wasn't doing this job. If I wasn't reviewing books for this show, I would never touch another one of these books from about Eliza. And I don't care what she did. Wouldn't care. I could could care less. I don't like her character at all. Okay, just bleh, don't like it. I'm just tired of the whole thing, and and I'm not trying to beat up Bagwell, but I'm just stating here's what's going on with me, and I know I can't be the only person who who feels this way. There has to be other people out there that are like, my gosh, she's a carbon copy of Jason for the most part, but she's wimpier. She's got no backbone. She's got no spine. Even in the next, the, the previous book, which will be the next book after this, if you go into a, a reading list series, she still seems wimpy, unsure of herself. There's no growth. So, you know, you've got two books with her being this wimpy character who's just overwhelmed by life. It's not fun to read. Jason, at least, grew some balls, and yeah, I'm going to say that, by, before the end of book one. You know, he, he got himself some cojones and stood up. She doesn't. Not in this book, not in the next book. Just cannot do that. Just cannot. Ah. Now, David Stifle, he stays true to form and does solid work as always. If you liked him on the other three books, you won't be disappointed here. He is probably the one saving grace that this book had. Because if he hadn't have been here to keep this story anchored, it would have drifted so far afield of where it should have been that it would have just gotten lost in the clouds. 
Okay? Like a fart in the wind, it'd have been gone. Stifle holds this thing together. I don't know how he manages it. I don't know what he does. But he does do a great job. And I think it's just because he's a professional. And Bagwell lucked out in getting Stifle to read these books. Because Stifle does do great. He keeps everything together. Uh, and I know there are a lot of Travis Bagwell fans out there. And I'm probably going to get a lot of naughty stuff sent to me about this. Hell, I know authors who won't even try to release a book near his release dates. But I'm growing less enthused about this series as it goes on. I'd like to see him either stick to Jason's exploits or create a character who doesn't have trolls for parents and actually has a spine in the brain that can be a little bit broken, okay? But I need a break from the weak, obsequious characters that he's pummeling us with. And Eliza is the biggest offender. Now, I'm giving this book a rating of seven stars, and I feel that that is just a revisit from the last book, and I'm giving credit for the previous first two books. Because, to me, if I had just picked this book up off the, the, the shelf and sat down with it, it sure as hell wouldn't be a 7. It wouldn't. It would have been right back in the trash bin with me when I was done. I can't take this. You know, I really cannot take this book. This is not a fun book for me, but I know it plays into the series. It is well written. Okay? It's got valuable, worthy things. And if you like the hippie, if you think Fluffy is funny... You love the book. I, I, I have no doubt about it. And that's why I'm being fair. I'm, I'm going to say a seven. You know, I've had to pull back because of enthusiasm. Here, I'm pushing forward because of a lack of enthusiasm. Okay? This book just drained me. I had narrators who just sucked the life out of me and made my ears bleed and my brain come out of my nose. Okay? This book just put me to sleep. Like I said, Awaken Online is an apt title because... You will fall asleep. If you're reading with your Kindle, you're going to fall asleep and wake up with it either burned out of energy, it's going to power it out, or you're going to wake up and go, why, why, why did I even pick up this book? You know, it's, it's just one of those things. So, thankfully, this was not a 20-second hour novel like he usually does, because I would have sincerely had a hard time finishing this book. There was a lot of things, like I say, that were not bad about the book. And if if you had trimmed it down to, seriously, if you had trimmed it down to about five hours, made it a novella, it would probably worked better. But the only way you could have done that would be to wipe out every single hippie quest. To wipe out the hippie. To wipe out Fluffy. You cut that out, you got a pretty good book. Well, a decent book. Eliza's still a weak character. She is just a tea bag that's been used over and over again until there's just barely able to give any color to the water anymore. I just can't take her as a character. I, and I'm sorry for that. I apologize to Travis Bagwell, but uh, this is a book I did not have fun with. And me being 6 out of 10, and I'm really being nice about it, because this book just just bored me to tears. It really did. I, I struggled to get through it. So I hope the rest of you enjoy this book. You like it. Give it a shot. Give it a chance, because I know that some people will find Fluffy funny, the hippie funny, the the... The, the way that she overcomes her adversaries, uh, unique and interesting. Me, I need action to go along with my intellect. I really do. I need to see how they think and fight. There's just not a lot of that going around in this book. So, sorry. Six out of ten. Best I could do. All right. The next book I'm going to do is Enhancer. The Enhancer series book one by Wyatt Kane, narrated by Chris Graves. Uh, and the length is 7 hours and 12 minutes. Ty. Ty Wilcox. You worthless slacker. You should have finished that by now. Hurry up. There's shitters that need to be cleaned. And some of them are nasty. Ty Wilcox was 26 years old and had the misfortune of working as the janitor at the concubine club. The name of which gave the place a far fancier impression than it really deserved. It was a pulsating labyrinth, flooded with noise and strobe lights of different colors that never quite alleviated the dark. A seething wall-to-wall -wall mass of people, gyrating to pseudo-musical beats that shook the walls. It was a fun place to be if you were young, part of the cool crowd, and liked to pay too much for fancy colorful cocktails and designer drugs as you bumped and swayed into others like you. Sadly, Ty wasn't part of the cool crowd. Not even close. 
He was angular, geeky, and had a mop of sandy hair that refused to behave. And in a time when genetic modifications were the norm, he had none. Enhancer is a book that I really should have saved for the upcoming special I'm going to be doing called Could It Be Game Lit or Is It Lit? Because according to the book's description, it has some light game lit elements. So I grabbed it for an examination. And when Kane says he, he light, he means light. Uh, the only thing that makes this remotely game lit is the fact that they use HUDs, you know, the heads up displays. Uh, and they have stats that they can increase ver via various manipulations like exercise or practice or some adjustments they make to their machines. Uh, otherwise, this is a straight up superhero harem tale that isn't half bad, but it's really not lit RPG to the core. I'm just telling you that right now. It, it's not crunchy. It's very, very light on the game mechanic stuff. Uh, like I said, what I just told you, that's the majority of it. So don't go running into this thinking it's game lit. Um, for 100%, it's not there. Uh, but it's not bad. It, the book does feel rushed. And I mean, there's really not much time between the time that the main character gains his powers until he's at the end fight with the boss. Character de development only comes from physical changes and is minimal when it comes to actual character growth. The sex scenes come off as a light form of uh, Late Night on Cinemax, slightly graphics, but graphic but not overly explicit, if you ask me. Now, the setup is pretty simple. The main character, Ty... Uh, encounters a battle between two supers, and when one of the hero is killed, Ty grabs a strange device that the villain is trying to get that was on the man's wrist and puts it on. That's a smart move. This big giant hulking dude just killed this guy over here who's got superpowers for the device that's on the ground, and you take it. Yep, that's the first thought I would have, because superpowers and all. He had no idea what it did or why it was there. It could have just been his grandmother's bracelet for all they knew okay um so ty takes the strange device and puts it on and it turns out that this is the thing that turns mere mortals into superheroes uh the device clears up his acne hey that's a plus it, it makes him taller who doesn't want to be taller i know i would take that that thing and it makes him irresistible to any female who wears a device similar to him hmm very interesting, I think. So, the, the the device has some benefits, okay? Lucky dude that he is, he meets one of those ladies right at the end of the battle and wakes up naked in her safe house. Her name is Tempest, and she helps him learn the ropes. His powers, which he doesn't understand very well at first, help him to create or upgrade any kind of technology. This potentially makes him the most powerful hero that has ever existed. And of course, he doesn't realize that. She doesn't realize that. But you as a reader are going to say, well, heck, if he can take this, it's already powerful, make it bigger, better, and stronger, he's going to be able to do anything he wants. He can take a, a, a jetpack and make it, you know, go away speed. And he can take a, you know, a power, pal power pack and turn that into a super powerful force field and so on and so forth. And he kind of gets to that point after a little while. But like I say, it's like a two-day event from the time he gets his powers to the time the boss fight happens. So there's a lot of, you know, wheels spinning and not going very far uh, for character growth. The book's short, believe it or not. For the seven hours or so that it is, it, it really could have been a lot longer because it needed it. There were just it just for some reason, uh, and it wasn't because you're like, wow, that book was so great. It was just it went by so fast. It just doesn't have a whole lot of character growth or development. You just don't feel that. And you're kind of worried that, you know, you miss something, but you don't. Um, like I say, it's a good book. It, it's fun, and it does ha it does hold your interest, but it's not deep, not by any means. Now, uh, Ty is fortunate uh, that he has met the creators of the wristbands, okay? Well, he didn't really meet the creator. The creator is the architect, who just happens to have been Tempest's father. So he meets him vicariously, uh, who also kind of has a secret lab right in her place with like a million schematics uh, that Ty can use to create or upgrade new power items. Now, that's a, a stroke of luck if ever I heard one. He could have been anywhere else in the country and got this uh, little bracelet to give him powers and been nowhere near the architect's thing. But fortunately for him, not only is the super hot chick that he is hot for, the daughter of the architect, he also happens to have, right at his fingertips, 
the man's laboratory. So coincidental, right there it is. Um, in between, Ty manages to have sex with Tempest and her roommate, who is a human-deer hybrid. Uh, now, the sex scenes are not as hard as they could have been, and they play out a little lighter than Late Night Cable. And I pretty much say that if you're going to go for a sex scene, have a freaking sex scene. Okay, If it's not a fade to black, which I am fine with, if you're going to do that, fade to black, just cut away and, and, and leave it to the imagination. That's a perfectly acceptable thing. Otherwise, don't skimp. Don't hold back. Be graphic. Tell a story. Don't worry about what's going to happen to other people reading this. They're adults. They'll be able to handle it. Okay. Um, now, one thing that really drove me crazy is that the Deerkin character has antlers. Now, I know I say this all the time. Research, research, research. In nature, the only types of female deer who have any kind of antler are, one, female deer who have high levels of testosterone, or reindeer. Female reindeer also have antlers, okay? She's not a reindeer. And I don't think, from what I saw or read, uh, that she has high levels of testosterone, okay? It, no ding, she doesn't have them. Um, she was not a modified human reindeer, um, so I would let this slide if it was just a cosmetic change, but my understanding was it was far more than superficial. Uh, he could have just done something like giving her doe ears and maybe like some skin coloring in addition to her hooves and tails, her tail. Uh, it's details like that that throw me off and out of a book really quickly, easily research details, making things work. And if you're going to just say, yeah, it's just for fun, it is. But it doesn't work. You know, you just can't make it happen because you want to. If you're going to do something like that, kind of stick to reality to a certain extent. I just don't like it when that sort of stuff happens. Also, I have to say that the end battle was incredibly outrageous and so poorly planned, I don't understand how the, the villain didn't destroy them. Just don't. Ty had open access to the architect's plans, schematics, and concept designs for much more than 24 hours. And that's the best plan he could come up with? Really? Really? I mean, he'd already designed a super suit with himself replete with offensive and defensive capabilities. He should have been able to design something in the time that he had that would have given them much more of an upper hand. And he could have done a few more things to improve their situation. It was really just silly. But they still had time for sex. Okay? The story is fast-paced. And like I said, that's because there's very little development. The characters are very stereotypical. Uh, they're shallow. Uh, for example, Ty's boss is a clear case of Dolores Umbridge from Harry Potter being inserted into a non-teaching role. Ty is a reluctant hero. Tempest is the hardcore hero who brooks no insolence. And the villain is loud and obnoxious and is pretty much a major a-hole. In other words, he's just what you would expect each of them to be. Okay, Every one of them plays into that role perfectly. Graves is a good narrator who handles the book's poor pacing, i.e. rapid plot advancement, in the best way he can. He also tries really hard to take two-dimensional characters and breathe some life into them. His female voices aren't half bad, but he only did three of them, so I'm not sure how much variation or range he has. I haven't heard enough yet to make that decision. Uh, I'll need to hear him a few more times before I do decide on just how far he can push his limits. Either way, I enjoyed his work. I don't think you'll have a problem with it either. The book was a little thin and certainly felt like it was a bare-bones edition of what could have been a pretty epic story. It needed more characterization and development to make this a solid tale. For that reason, I'm going to hit it with a 7.3 star rating. And I really don't have much choice. That's about as good as I can go. There was a lot of potential, but most of it was overlooked. Uh, like I say, just having sex before the big scenes... Rather than doing research or building when that's his job, he could have come up with a much better plan. Uh, it just didn't make sense to me at all. It was just it was just a really weak ending. Uh, I will get the next book, and hopefully some of these issues will be addressed. It was a fun story. I don't have much of a problem otherwise. But like I say, it's really, really game light. So uh, I, I really should have kept this for my special. But I I'd started into this, and I said, ah... I've got more than enough books for the, is it game lit or could it be game lit or lit RPG? Uh, and I think we're good with that. So this is fine. Uh, I'm putting it out here like it is. Uh, so I hope you enjoy it. All right. So the next book I'm going to be reviewing is The Luck Stat Strategy, Secrets of the Old One, book one. 
And why have I waited so long? I don't know. The book is written by Blaze Corbin. Narrated by Jeff Hayes. What? Jeff Hayes and Blaze Corbin together again. And the book's length is four hours and 45 minutes. Bale was about to try reading his grimoire again when the entire coach lurched to the side. A deafening explosion exerted physical pressure on his ears and body. The vehicle righted itself, and Vale became aware of the sounds of pursuit. Judging by the clopping of all the horse hooves, there had to be more than one other stagecoach out there. Vale's NPC driver started yelling and cursing. Vale blinked in surprise, but his hard-won instincts after playing SOO for a year kicked in. He stuffed the grimoire into his inventory, an internal storage for a limited number of non-weapon items, and stuck his head out the window. He almost got nailed by a flaming crossbow bolt that sped past into the night before exploding somewhat beyond his coach. Shit! He hollered. He ducked his head back into the stagecoach and thought furiously about what to do. In his brief glance outside, he'd seen at least three other stagecoaches chasing him. The fact his vehicle wasn't already splinters was proof they wanted him alive. So, I'm reviewing this book now for a couple of reasons. First, it's because... Blaze Corvin. Uh, <clears throat> Corvin is probably one of my favorite authors altogether. And Delvers is honestly probably my top tier go to favorite book shelf. Okay. If you, you said any genre whatsoever, what's one of your favorite books? I'm going to hit Delvers nine out of ten times and say go to that, that series because it's just fantastic. I love Jason and Henry. I love everything that goes on in the stories. <clears throat> Blows me away. And this is a total departure from that series. Now, normally, you would hear me gripe and complain. I would be carping. Yes, yeah, you know, my favorite author's greatest story has been departed from once more. He's stepping aside from something, and, you know, he's trying something new. Wah, wah, wah. But that's not what I'm doing here. I mean, this was really... It's scary how masterful this piece of work was. Um, or is, I should say. Uh... Everything about it is just perfectly crafted, and it's so amazing and such a standalone story from Delvers, it just doesn't get the love it deserves. Secondly, it has Jeff Hayes, and I mean, and, and you know, I know I say it all the time, Jeff is my favorite narrator, but I mean, in this case, he really goes above and beyond what he needs to do, and I'll get into all that later on, but straight up, there's no reason why you haven't gotten this book. Now, I'm going to rant a little bit here because I love Delvers and, and I appreciate how much Corbin gives back to his readers. And this is one of those books that if you have read it, you want more of it immediately. Sincerely, you will crave this stuff like a $5 hooker craves some smack. The problem is this book is just not leaping off the shelves. And since Blaze has bills that he has to pay, you know, he writes what pays them. You know, as the song goes, he's got bills. He's got to pay. He's got mouths to feed. So why would he write something that no one reads, regardless of how amazing it is? This is just pretty much a passion project for him. He even has a cover ready to go rolling on book number two. And do you know why this book isn't done yet? Well, of course, like I just said, he's got bills he's got to pay. But, but, every time he gets ready to get into it, maybe just start a little bit, Somebody demands the sequel ASAP, and it puts him right off. And instead of being entitled and demanding, and believe me, I completely get that you want, nay, crave more of the magic that he doth produce, you might suggest to people that you know to actually buy the book. Word to mouth the hell out of it, people. That's what I'm saying. I actually said to myself, Self, you are constantly bragging about Delvers and Nora, but when was the last time you mentioned the Luxstat strategy to anybody? I mean, to anyone? I almost replied, but then I realized I'd ask myself a rhetorical question, and I didn't have a rhetorical answer. So, I figured that the least I could do would be to write a review of this amazing novella, because it's a novella, and get it out onto some people's radar. Maybe they would then tell their friends, and they would tell their friends, and so on, and so on, and so on! <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry, that's Pee Wee Herman takes me over sometimes. Okay, anyway, I'm back. Until, by merit of exponential growth, this book hits the top of the charts and takes off like a bat out of hell with its ass on fire. I'm realistic. 
And my hope is that someone will caught on to how just good this book is and spread the gospel of Luxstadt. Okay, I'm sorry if I'm prophetizing too much, but this book really is that endearing and easily garners such fervor and devotion. Seriously, I really don't know anybody who's read it that I've spoken with that doesn't want more immediately, that weren't blown away by the story, that just were not ensorcelled and, and, and drawn in to the whole concept that Blaze created. So have I got your attention yet? Okay, good. Well, let me tell you about this roller coaster that is the secret of the old ones. And when I say roller coaster, I don't mean a wimpy roller coaster like the Magnum XL over at Cedar Point in Ohio here. I am talking the Kingdom Ka, the Mount Everest of roller coasters. This book starts off with a PvP battle between old bitter enemies, kind of like Indiana Jones versus Belloc in Raiders of the Lost Ark. There are some pretty hard feelings, and needless to say, that things don't get better once the loser is looted. Uh, the book is a mix of Lovecraft and steampunk, and it's well thought out, expertly crafted, the gaming rules are well designed. The writing is about a game in which you, you could lose your sanity, and writing about that sort of stuff can't be easy. I mean, Corvin not only makes it look easy, he makes you wonder why it really isn't implemented everywhere. I mean, seriously. I, I know if I was sent to, you know, Dolos' world, world on Delvers and came face-to-face -face with one of the monsters there, I'd probably lose a few points of sanity just from the transport from here to there in the, in the first place. Facing a monster would really cause me to lose my stuff, okay? And they're just regular monsters, not Lovecraftian-style ones, although Delvers does kind of have that with the Black Road. Okay, well, I'm, I'm digressing. The setting is very similar to England in the 1800s. Very, very Victorian, and thus the steampunk aspect. But the setting lends itself so well that the Cthulhu influences feel natural, even though Lovecraft did a lot of his stuff, you know, in the main area and that sort of thing, you know, Miskatonic. Victorian England is ripe for this sort of a setting. The story itself is tightly written. There is no excess, and thus no punches are pulled. The book has some amazing action sequence, is, sequences, and the final fight on the train is a major standout scene. I think about it all the time. Just like Delvers, when, you know, one of the boys goes toe-to-toes with Dolos' priestesses, it was just something you don't ever forget. I mean, both of those scenes are in my head at various times, you know, during the week. I just keep going back to them. This is not your standard. Players go off to kill something for three, you know, for 30,000 words. There's a lot going on, and there are just hints, just hints of even bigger and better things to come. One of my favorite aspects was that this was not only PvE and PvP, but there didn't seem to be a safe zone that Trent, the, you know, the main character, that's his real name, could flee to in order to escape his pursuers. Also, the whole sanity check mechanic worked really well. And if you've ever played COC, that's Call of Cthulhu for you heathens, then you will really respect it here. It was like a snuggly tentacle wrapping around your limp body. Okay? Uh, the book is really worth it. Honestly, I don't know why, because it's just shy of five full hours. But again, I keep going over. The, the amount of writing doesn't matter. It's a novella. You know that going in. The, the, the story is just so addictive it's scary you, you read it and you become a rabid fan it's just that good so much happens it's hard for me to tell you everything because the book is such a whirlwind and you just wonder where it went and what will be coming next and sometimes i have to wonder i think the book is actually cursed to be a secret that only old timers will look back fondly you know in the years to come and whisper oh i remember the train fight when when all was lost. I sincerely hope that isn't the case. And that Blaze writes so many of these books, he runs a series right into the ground. I really think that the thing that is holding this book back is its title, believe it or not. Secrets of the Old Ones sounds like a bunch of old men in a nursing home trying to figure out who farted. You know, no one's going to admit it. But that's what it is. And the Luxstat strategy part... Well, that sounds like something a college mathematics professor would come up with to try to make money in Vegas. Either way, they're just not, you know, eye-catching or ear-catching or imagination-snatching. Um, 
and I'm not one to make up titles. Believe me, I, I can't tell you what to call this. But make a change. Call it Misc Miskatonic Steampunk or, you know, Miska Steampunk or Deep Ones Rising or something. Give it a new title. Re reformat it. Repackage it and put it back out. Make sure people know it's lit RPG. And that will help you get this book pushed. Because I honestly think that that is half the battle right there is the title. Because I remember so many people saying how great the book was. And I kept thinking, why the hell would I want to read that? Okay, and I, I, I do. I go back and I look at what made me get the book. And the book was word of mouth in the first place. So many people speaking so highly of it. And after a while, I broke down and said, oh, the hell with it. I'll just get the book and see what I think. And, and it did. It killed me because it made me want more immediately. I was like, where's book two? Where's the rest? Why isn't this bigger? Why isn't the next book, you know, twice the size of the first book? Because there's no book out there. I can't even do anything to estimate. That's how good the book is. It really grabs you. Finally, and I come to the amazing work by Jeff Hayes. And I have to say that his narration here is some of the best that I've ever him do. And I don't want to call him subdued, but he is very restrained and in control of the characters and the pacing of the story. So well, in fact, that it's scary. He adds to the Lovecraftian atmosphere in such an integrated way that you can just feel the call of the old ones in the background. He brings a menace of being stalked and an ambience of quiet desperation from the main character. And when it gets to the action, I can't see anyone doing it better. Like I say, that train ride scene was just intense. It was action-packed and filled and fraught with danger. He made you feel every single second of it. Okay? I know I praise Jeff a lot, and it might be because he's my favorite narrator. But he really deserves it. I mean, especially here. This was just an incredible ride, okay? That train ride, I keep thinking about it, and, and like I say, he pulled that out of a hat. This is an excellent pairing, you know, Corvin and haze that goes together like wine and cheese only with blood slimy tentacles and dead bodies strewn about <sighs> so i've gotten that off my chest just don't feel entitled don't yell and tell blaze corbin every five minutes you want the next book it's great because i do the same thing i'll be like when's delvers four coming out blaze yeah Nora's great Nora's good i like it yeah but i need my delvers i need jason and henry Everybody does that, and I'm sure as a writer, it's got to be wearing, okay? There's just there's certain things you can't do. You can't push it. You're not entitled because if the writer decides he doesn't want to go back to it, no matter how much time you've invested, and believe me, I know what it's like to get invested in characters. There are characters who I cherish and I need to see. I go back and revisit them if the, the writer no longer exists, if he's dead. So I go back and I, I, I reread those stories. But you are not entitled to have more it's at the, the 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 beneficial magnificence of the writer itself to create these stories for us. And the only way you can convince them of doing that is by filling their pockets full of bread, green stuff, loot, cash, moolah, that sort of stuff. Because they appreciate that more than they do me saying, Hey, Blaze, you were amazing. Hey, Jeff, your voice work is just incredible. That's great, guy. I really appreciate it. But give me a few bucks and I'll be happy to say thank you and move along. Now, the only caveat that I put here is that the disclaimer is to say the next book will come out. We just don't know when. So if you're afraid to jump into an amazing book just because there's no definitive time for it to be released, then go away. Because we have no way of knowing when this book will come out next. We know it'll come, that Blaze will eventually get back to it, but like I say, he's got other things in the line first. So the best thing I could suggest to you to do is to consider this like an amuse-bouche, you know, a nice little bite, a tasty, delicious bite that makes you crave more, more. Just enjoy that wonderful bite you've been given, and hopefully it will turn into an appetizer the next time it comes around, and then finally the main course. So here's my, my score, okay? No matter what I do, it's either going to be too high or too low because I love this book. Uh, it's Corvin, it's Hayes, it's crushing me. So I'm just going to say 8.6 because it is there and the storyline is there and the characters are there. Everything that you need 
for an incredible sh story is right there. And what's great about it is, is that there's nothing that's packed in there overly so. It's not full of junk. This book is trimmed. It's tight. Okay, anything that's extraneous was cut away. He cut away all the fat and left you nothing but the meat. And that's the fact of it. It's just that good of a story. 8.6 stars. You will be happy that you took the chance. Get it now and then spread the word. Spread the word. Tell Blaze, great job. I bought the book. I listened to it. It was amazing. And then maybe he'll get to this a little bit quicker than what we hope. Okay, because it's only four, a little over four and a half hours. I think he could crank out another one of those books that same size in no time at all, given the opportunity. So 8.6 stars. You won't be disappointed. You just will be left wanting more. All right. Finally, for today, here is my sound booth spotlight. I'm going to go into one of my favorite uh, authors and, of course, my favorite narrator, so it's it's a it's a hell of a team up right here. I'm going to do Reapers and Repercussions, book four of the Feedback Loop, written by Harmon Cooper and narrated by the ever amazing Jeff Hayes. My mind is blown always. Uh, and the book's length is a short. I mean, seven and a half hours, seven hours, thirty two minutes. There's not enough quantum hues, but as you'll see, there's not enough of other players as well. Let the game begin the booming voice rings out all around us as the sound of the crowd swells to the eastern side of the field is the king's skybox area or whatever it's called in medievalese a bracket appears on the screen announcing our guild name and the guild name of our opponent draco dormian's nunquam titillandis or apparently the dd nuts for short i don't even want to know what that means i grumble rocket it means never tickle a sleeping dragon. Me. What part of I don't even want to know what that means do you not understand? The trumpet sounds. The knights versus five dwarves riding giant kangaroo rats, a.k.a. the DD nuts. My turn. I move my hands to equip my Tickle Me Elmo themed nutcracker. Item 98. Not quite, says Sophia. They charged us, so they get the first attack. The first three dwarves miss their attacks on Sophia and Venier. They almost hit Aiden, who is saved by Chrono. One of the dwarves rides towards me, his tongue wagging and his eyes radiating fury as he sizes me up. All right, Cooper returns to Proxima Galaxy, and everybody's favorite. I don't know if you don't like him, but I love the guy. It's his, it's, he's, he's the best smart mouth written right now I, I know of. Quantum Muse, okay, and he returns in style. Now, my biggest beef with this book with this dish is there's not enough Francis Euphoria. I love that dame. She is the coolest broad I know. And the search here for God's Six son is still ongoing. And the dream team is finally making some progress on finding his location. But they end up getting sidetracked and doing a mission for one of the upper crust personages that think their Diz Nikes don't stink. And, you know, sneakers smell, if you, especially if you saw how Quantum treats his. They really stink. I, I can't find a pair of Nikes. Okay, I've, I've looked. I wish I could find some. Harmon, if you know where they're sold, let me know, because I really do want some Nikes. Um, anyway, it was a blast seeing Quantum get some payback on the Reaper B-holes that has been a plug in his butt for a few books. Because as this has this has probably the best use of a sword stick I've ever heard. Okay. Now, seriously, Hughes is twice as mouthy and grumpier than ever, and his team seems to be suffering from the we-can't-trust-anybody virus, as one or two members kind of do some shady dealings or break a lot uh, easier than they should have when it comes to questioning. Quantum might be out of the action for a little while in this book, but his arena fights are the stuff of legends. And if you want to talk about funny, okay, and this is where I say I love Quantum. He is a fast-talking, oh, he is a fast-talking character. And the stuff he comes up with just every 10 minutes just kills me. All I can say is there are two bits, two bits that, oh, made me laugh so hard it was ridiculous. One is in which Quantum is chided for being a racist. Uh, the first is which he says the word English prees, 
back and forth that made me belly laugh. Okay, and I was I was literally getting out of the car to walk into work when that hit me, and I I, I almost fell onto the parking lot. It was so so funny. Uh, and the other was about Islamic prophesizing that literally, as I said, almost made me fall out of my car. But this time, thankfully, I was in the building um, because I was laughing so hard. I literally couldn't go inside because I was laughing so hard. You know, funeral homes are not conducive to areas of laughter very often. So uh, I had to stay out for a few minutes. Turned it off and everything because if I'd kept listening, I'd probably whizzed my pants and embarrassed myself and then had to go back and change my clothes and come back. And it just, it was not, not good. Uh, and that's why I say Cooper knows how to write funny. Jeff Hayes knows how to play it. That's key. These two go together really well. Um, Cooper is the, clearly the snarkiest snark that ever snarked, and he uses that to his advantage. I would fear having an actual physical confrontation with him just on the basis that somewhere back in his lizard brain lurked a fully, four quantum, fully formed quantum hues who was ready to strike verbally at the slightest hint of vulnerability. I mean... Quantum is one of these guys you do not want to get into a battle of wits with because no matter what you're carrying, you don't have the proper gear. Okay, I'm just going to put it out there. And I also, uh, I love the, the cover. Uh, QPappy187 looks suitably vicious, but I would have loved to have seen him in his life vest with hacky in his hand, and that would have fit so much better than the grim and dark angle that they show here. But, I mean, hey, you got to go with what sells, and this cover is an attention grabber. I mean, check it out. It looks pretty pretty awesome. Now, i got to talk about Hayes and his narration. Really? Yes, I do! Because no one, and I mean no one else, could play this fast-talking wiseacre, Quantum, like Hayes does. I, I mean, there are some great narrators out there, and I could go on and on and say, you know, there's, there's so-and-so, but I'm, I don't want to put that out because I'm going to say they can't do it. I think the other narrators would just get marble mouthed as they try to keep up. Okay, they couldn't do it. They just could not keep up with Hughes. Plus, it's refreshing, I have to say, to see Hayes just doing an entire book solo. I appreciate the other SBT cast members. I really do. I mean, I think you've heard me say it enough. Lori Catherine Winkle, you know, Annie Ellicott, uh, Justin Thomas James, they are amazing, amazing narrators. But Jeff just rocks these stories out all on his own. And Quantum Hughes is 100% Jeff all the way. He spits out the quotes and phrases that would stunt a lesser narrator's growth. And he does so with a plum. Shockingly, I do have a few small issues that I have to take with the Master of the Vocal Arts. First, the after aforementioned is Lomic Bit. There's a bit of a pause that goes on a little bit longer when the Giants speaking to the Dream Team than there should be. It's minor, but it's there. I noticed it as soon as it, I was listening to it. Um, and it, it kind of feels like uh, it was a piece that got spliced back into the story. Uh, like you had to redo a flub line and just backed up. The timing was just a little bit off. And next, and this is strictly because I know several chefs. My son is going to school to be a chef. Um, and I think if, if I were to say it, I, I would get smacked in the mouth with a wet rag, um, but Jeff says the word saucier in a distinctly uh, uh, American manner, okay? Uh, technically, the word he is trying to say is saucier. Um, it's French, and it's the person who makes the sauces. Saucier is something that you could say that woman's a little saucier than I expected, uh, which means, you know, she's either really... Uh, spicy or hot or she's got a mouth on her one two three there's three options right there um but every time he says saucier it kind of hit me um it's saucier with the a being the long vowel and the, the same way that the person who you know I'll, I'll put like this comparatively it's saucier in the same way that the person who recommends wine is a sommelier Okay, it's not sommelier, it's sommelier and a saucier. Uh, and it's just one of those things where, again, if I'm going to call somebody out for mispronouncing, I'm going to do it here too. And uh, Jeff, please forgive me, please. You know, I love you, man. You know, I think you're the best, but I got to call this out. I mean, like I said, I just know too many chefs. And if I don't say this, when we talk about this, they're going to really hit me with it. Okay, and especially my son because he laughs at me when I, I, I was saying this. 
He, he was like, that's just not the way to do it. So I'm just going to back up a little bit, say I'm sorry. But, okay, and it's, if you don't believe me, just check out Top Chef sometimes. I'm sure they'll give you the real skinny on how to pronounce these items. And I don't want to pick at nits. Seriously, I'm not pointing a no-no finger at Jeff. But it does need pointed out. So, what does that mean? I mean, with all the issues I took with Umbridge, you know, I mean, there's less Francis than I would have liked, uh, you know, and, and there's one word being mispronounced, and there's a small, minute pause. I mean, honestly, those are all little things. I mean, if it's just one word that's been mispronounced, you know, about four times, big whip, big whip. You know, step off and learn uh, that this is a great book because it is just amazing. I have no problems with this. You know, Francis can't be in every book. There's just going to be characters. Just like what I say with uh, Charles Dean all the time, I need more Miller. Miller is probably one of my favorite characters in the history of writing. But he can't be on every single page. He can't. Uh, it would just take away from the character, first of all, and he would not be as intriguing or exciting to me. I really love the character, just like I love Francis, but she cannot be there every single time that something happens. They have to step back, and there's reasons for everything. <clears throat> but Jeff really embodies the spirit and the voice of Quantum Hughes. He's incredible. And I really appreciate the effort that he puts in here because I cannot imagine how many times he has had to redo a scene strictly because uh, he probably stumbled. Because I know that I could not speak at the speed at which he does and sound remotely coherent or, you know, understandable. And yet he spits this stuff out like he's on fire. Uh, so, I mean, he's it, it, just incredible with it. I really imagine that there's no one else that could do this job other than him, and that's because that's the case. Um, Narration-wise, the book is on point. Two little hitches in the giddy-up as far as I was concerned, and honestly, they're minor things. Uh, if it had been 30 or 40 or 50 times of him saying saucier, then I might have had, you know, you know, I mean, he would say saucier. So I can't even say it. I have to say it the right way. I can't help it. Um... If he had been saying saucier, you know, like ensign, you know, I would have had a bit more of an issue with it. But it's not. And, you know, because of all that, I might give a subtraction of 0.0001% of a star. So rounding up, there's really no negligible difference. This book takes the Proxima Galaxy and sucks it into a black hole of pure awesomeness. You cannot go wrong with this tag team of Cooper and Hayes. Final score is 8.3 stars. You will enjoy it if you really like Harmon Cooper and Jeff Hayes. And who doesn't? Uh, but if you don't like fast talking, then you probably want to skip this because that is the character that you get. He is quick-witted, quick-mouthed. He is quick to anger, quick to fight, quick to strike. And you have to respect a character who knows what he does and does it well. Okay? So 8.3 that's where I'm going with this right now. You uh, enjoy the afternoon because I'm done with this review. Hmm. Well, that's it for this week's show, guys. Thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate everyone taking the time to watch or listen uh, to the show. I really appreciate the support you've been showing. Uh, and if you want to, you're always welcome to like Lit RPG Podcast Facebook page or the YouTube page or just share the video. And I always say this, and I'm always going to say this. Please, please, please leave your comments below on the YouTube page or on our shared Facebook announcements. I really do enjoy listening to you, getting your feedback, and chatting back and forth. Uh, it's a great thing to do, and I'm never going to get offended. Tell me whether you like it, you hate it, and I will come right back to you and, and say, okay, I will try to fix this. So, please don't forget, uh, you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, or YouTube. Uh, <clears throat> even next week, we're going to be on HBO, I think. Ramon says no, no HBO, I'm sorry. So, just go back to Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. Okay, maybe we'll get HBO sometime. In the... No, no, never. Okay, I'm sad to hear that. I was kind of hoping to meet the cast of Game of Thrones. Okay, anyway, that's it for the show, guys. For the Lit RPG Audiobook Podcast, I'm Ray. Keep listening. <laughs>